Mathias Mpo Gansamba ya kulira government ya Chagulani mu parliament. Olwalero akoze echenja ulo, eche unisi zauli omu, elensi yonane unikirira. Parliament ya unikiride, olwabi no Mathias Mpo Gansamba vya vumbu de, elabi ya yanjuri de parliament lunako olwalero. <laughs> government ya mwaimu seven, elabi keri muru suvo, ele sawa yona mwandi mkubila kukajambo, nga asura yo. Uh, Chagulani senta mwalo bati Bobby Wine, aliku kukuba uh, gudi kude, alimuku zina mazina, kubanga katibine vitu useo, alavi kanga obu wangu zibuli mkule kera jari. Kasotu kende mparlament, walabe nsonga, mathas mpuga nsamba za vumbu dona kuruwarelo, ele vya fayo vya koze, vita agenda kufa kulikodi, nga vya alubele da, vijia kogeru wako ANC, emine mbe ne emine mbe, amina. And we've wait, we've been able to wait because the leader of opposition requested for more time. That's why we've had to come in today. Much obliged, right, Honorable. Uh, speaker, I don't know, speaker, protect me from uh, the menacing eyes of the honorable both or both. Uh, menacing looking at me and trying to intimidate me and other at uh, this afternoon. <laughs> Honor, order. Right, honorable. Speaker, is it in order for the leader of opposition to oppose the way God created me handsomely? Right, Honorable Speaker, I know that he opposes everything, but must he oppose the wonderful, handsome face of a God? Is it in order? Uh, of course, the, the most handsome person in the whole of Eastern Uganda is Honorable O. -O. So everybody will always admire him. He's not in order. Uh, right, Honorable Speaker, I actually concede. I was looking at him admirably, and then he menacingly looked at me. That's why I raised it to your attention. Right, Honorable Speaker, I thank you for your kind indulgence. Yes, this, this particular response. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> um, the what? Honorable Leader of Opposition, we do not have your report uploaded, so we don't know how we are going to follow you without a soft copy of your report. Madam Speaker, this document was received uh, in the clerk's office on 13th of this month, and it should have been uploaded a generation ago. Okay. It, uh, it's not there, then uh, we need to find out why. It was long, long, long received, and uh, I apologize to the member it's not there, but it was really about the attention of officialdom for uploading. Uh, Honourable members, as a way to confirm, there is a network problem. Uh, Lob can continue reading his report. Much obliged, Right Honourable Speaker. Allow me share a copy with the Right Honourable Speaker. With the VP. And the Right Honourable Vice President. She's not a right honorable vice president. Oh, She's I, her I beg your pardon, right honorable speaker. Her excellence. Her excellence is much appreciated and I apologize. Let her not pick the insinuations of OO again. Thank you so much, love. Thank you, Rachel, Honorable Speaker. No, he's going to make a summary of whatever he's presenting. Just like I made a summary of what you presented, he's also going to make a summary. Rachel, Honorable Speaker, 
the president of the republic spoke for half a day i don't need half an hour to make my response so i invite members to exercise patience and restraint to give the views of uh, five million voters that voted with me i don't know speaker I want to speak uh, on uh, 7th June this year. The president delivered the set of the national address 2023, to which I'm enjoying it to respond under Rule 53 of our rules of procedure. I want to speak. Uh, I want to speak on the colleagues. While the set of the national address is a constitutional obligation, and the yearly tradition detailing the status of the country and unveiling the government's agenda for the coming year. It is unfortunate, rather, that in many respects, we refer to it as a reach of sorts. We therefore indisputably express our disappointment that for a country that has been hallowed out by gross abuse of human rights, over the couple, last couple of years, engrossed in runaway corruption and a general decline in the standard of living and malfeasance, no concrete policy direction to address the pressing needs of the citizenry was presented. A crisis of this nature, right, Honorable Speaker, demands an urgent action and sound leadership and direction. Let us speak on March 31st, 2023. We presented at, as, at the opposition budget conference themed Rethinking Uganda's Economy, a human rights approach in which we outlined our key budget priorities and the policy alternatives. I wish to appraise this house that I have since been on the trail on a countrywide oversight, right on the speaker, monitoring the extent of implementation of key government programs as mandated of me by the constitution and our rules of procedure. I will at an opportune moment, exhaustively report to this house on my key findings. In the same late right on the speaker, more in doing than in departing from the arbitrary norm this year, the opposition in parliament opts to respond by highlighting the prevailing set of affairs vis-a-vis -vis what the president presented. Therefore, right on speaker, the local response has taken a human rights-based approach to the national state of affairs and development. Right on speaker and honorable colleagues, we are guided by the unquestionable truth that human rights embody the key values of freedom, fairness, dignity, equality, and respect. They are valid as they guarantee freedom of choice and expression and the right to basic needs necessary for full development and enjoyment of rights, including education, water, sanitation, food, health, and housing. They are an important means of protection for us all, especially those who may face abuse, neglect mm -hmm. and isolation by people or entities that are more powerful mm. furthermore right on the speaker human rights inform the relationship that exists between individuals and their governments distinguishing between every human being and governmental and non-governmental actors obligated to respect protect and fulfill these rights sadly right on the speaker the sitting government has failed to address the pressing needs of our society, which ultimately tantamount to the abuse of human rights and the fundamental freedoms, which include the right to decide who shall govern the people of Uganda and how they should be governed, that is, through regular free and fair elections of their representatives. And on a valid and current note, right on the speaker, the ugly reality of malpractice in the recent by-elections in Oyamu North is still fresh in our minds, at least it is disturbing. This is in light of the fact that our kin in the neighborhood in Omoro 
just a year ago, are still aghast at how the military could shamelessly visit violence on the unarmed voters at La Logi, just to ensure that a candidate with sympathy from the powers that be wins an election to replace no, a noble yes. man. No. Honorable members, check it's uploaded under statements. Okay, you can continue. That a man favored wins to replace a noble man, the right honorable speaker. The script that the government has recurrently read from has formed the cast to cast a grim theater in Ikayunga and recently in what here of Bukedi, the original speaker. The ghastly strain on the state of democracy undermines the principle that holding regular free and fair elections is the hallmark of building a democratic society, especially that we feature very embarrassingly on this front as a country. It is a concrete proof of the failure by government to offer and manage the best governor election and a vote of no confidence in the government and its rhetoric that democracy can be a principle of reference in Uganda. The wanton electoral irregularities like belt staffing, voter bribery, and use of force and intimidation by security operatives and other government officials exhibit a high degree of primitivity. We therefore re-emphasize the need for constitutional and electoral reforms targeted at enhancing democracy, the rule of law, and constitutionalism in the country. It is therefore our considered belief and a conviction that the policy platform of the nation at any single moment should aspire to uphold the state standards of conformity to globally acceptable levels of human rights. It is, this is if, if we are able, if we are to be true, the fact that we are signatory to a plethora of international instruments on human rights where we should be seen to walk on the talk. Right on the speaker, I will outline briefly in the next moment our key observations and the departures, including concomments on a few issues obtaining to the state of the nation. First, the right to life. Right on the speaker, the right to life is a fundamental right, whereby without it, the enjoyment of other rights is not possible. As a minimum, the right to life imposes upon states the duty to abstain from arbitrarily killing individuals under their jurisdiction. The paradigm violations of the right to life are the extrajudicial executions undertook as killings that are committed, condoned, or acquiesced by governments. We are disheartened by a number of people who have been killed under the watch of the state, I will still I will list some of the killings that have been that have remained unaccounted for and uninvestigated. Yet the government operatives had direct link to these atrocities. We shall not relent in reminding ourselves, right on the speaker, and demanding a report of the infamous November 2020 shootings, where many people, over 54, lost their lives. Scores were maimed and are still nursing grave injuries without any support from the government. Even the promised selective compensation for the victims and their families has never materialized. Let me speak, I will remember the president saying that the victims have classifications. There are those that are innocent, will be compensated. There are those that were directly involved. Uh, he gave them a description that does not require our record. Nothing like compensation has ever materialized, rational speaker, meaning that it was political rhetoric. Additional rational speaker, many citizens were killed and others injured while on, on campaign trail for the new party president, I was correct, who was contesting for president in 21. I have listed those who were killed, starting with his bodyguard, St. Ezra Kalibala, who was buried in my constituency. He was killed in broad daylight at Usega. We actually have on record a military vehicle that knocked him deliberately. No investigation, no report. He is somebody's son and somebody's father. Michael Kalinda, Rita Nabu Kenya, Daniel Cheyune, 
Ibrahim Mutasa, Wele Kayondo, Sofi Kusasira, Beka Kato, Short from Namlanda, Martin Uwekiche, Tusubira Elijah, Mukibe Elijah of Luelo, Uma Lusema Kula of Entebbe, Katwele Kimuli of Seta, Msi Alan of, of Mukono, Peter Mwanjo of Nansana, Mugerwa William of Wangulukuku, Batio Sofi of Obongi, Alion Nobati of Obongi, Fungaro Moro of Obongi, Shaba Safit of Obongi, Akima Bire of Obongi. The liberty drowned by the army on 15th January 2021. No investigation, no report. The family has information on the participants, nothing. These are records on our face. The president ought to have spoken about these violations and offered the nation hope. He was mute. Is he an accomplice or not aware? Let alone speaker and comrades. Under a human rights compliant state, the obligation to respect the right to life goes beyond the straining and refraining from intentional and unlawful deprivation of life. The state must take appropriate steps to safeguard the lives of those within its jurisdiction. This includes measures aimed at controlling and limiting the circumstances in which state agents may use firearms to, in some cases, the provision of some commodities to keep one alive. It was last year that thousands starved to death in Karamoja. The relief purportedly advanced to them was nothing but dummies and superstition. Up to now, families in Karamoja are still starving. That's a denial of a right to life. The state has a duty to the people of Karamoja to have food. Dr. Honorable Speaker, in another dimension, it should be noted that enforced disappearances have no place in countries where the state uphold the right to life. It is hard to discern that three years now, the government has failed to account for citizens abducted by security operatives moving in drones on different dates between 2019 and 2021. We have made statements here, right on the speaker, as you collect at your permission and elsewhere. We have secured writs of habeas corpus against security agencies. I have repeatedly followed this matter with the Prime Minister and the Minister for Security and Defense, but regrettably, their responses are just explanations, but no consequence. Under normal circumstances, Regional Speaker, expeditious investigations would have been conducted into these disappearances. But alas, we are fed on horror undertakings by the executive, while our people continue disappearing mysteriously. On record, again, the following are missing persons under this regime. Kiyama Joni Bosco was abducted from Kanyanya on 3rd June 2021. The Prime Minister of the Republic, right on the speaker, informed the country that she knows where Chibarama is. It's four years since his disappearance. With your permission, we played a record of her speech in Parliament here, committing knowledge of the whereabouts of Chibarama. So I want to inform this House that the Prime Minister of the Republic has knowledge of the whereabouts of Mr. Chivalama. The family and the three children want their father. The wife wants to see her husband. I hope the Prime Minister from Chigali will come and take us where Chivalama is. It was her commitment that she knows where Chivalama is. Two, Semudu Maiko abducted from Kasubi on 28th November 2020. Damulira John from Kiseka Market on 21st December 2020. Mbabas Moses from Kiseka Market on 26th November 2020. Nalumoso Vincent from Mugorobi on 1st December 2020. Lukwago Martin from Mugorobi on 3rd November 2020. Kanata Mohammed from Mokono on 23rd December 2020. For the record, what honorable speaker, Kanata Mohammed was uh, one of the personal assistants of the Honorable Chonoka Abdallah. Is taking care of the family, educating children of Kanata since 2020. He disappeared up to now. St. Pijayuda 
abducted from Mukono on 19th December 2020, Musi Mbowa from Kisenyi on 18th December 2020, Kiria Peter from Nansan on 1st December 2020, Wangolo Shafik, Nansan on 3rd December 2020, Zimula Dennis, Nansan on 25th November 2020, Ruemba Mustafa, Nansan on 19th November 2020, Mubiru Hassan, Kawala 20th November 2020, Sesaz Isma, Makin, 19th November 2020, Kisembo Godfrey, Mubende Town, 12th February 2021, Joje Kasumba, Chotila, 19th January 2021, Baguma Joseph, Chebando, December 2020. I was in Chotila three weeks ago, I told speaker, the family raised this matter with me of the disappearance of their son. And nobody has ever visited them from government for an explanation, neither police for information. These are very harrowing situations, Rational Speaker. And you expect the head of state in this kind of, because the head of state on a set of a national address has space for assurance of victims and assurance of investigation, at least to hazard an investigation, Rational Speaker. Two, the right to freedom from torture, inhuman and degrading treatment. Article 24 of the Constitution of Uganda prohibits torture, cruel, inhuman, degrading treatment, right on the speaker, and punishment. This is one of the rights that are absolute and may not be subject to any exemption, even in times of war or emergency. Article 44A of the Constitution provides for non derogable delegation of the right of freedom from torture and cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, thus making this fundamental right absolute. The absolute prohibition of torture is set out in several international human rights treaties. For instance, the UN Convention Against Torture, to which Uganda ratified in 1986. The African Center for Treatment and Rehabilitation of Torture Victims issued a report in 2021 indicating that they registered more than 1,000 cases of torture and violence in Uganda, out of which 371 were committed by Uganda People's Defense Forces, 126 by the police. Acts of torture and degrading treatment have continued to surface, mostly perpetrated by security machinery, police, and military repeatedly employed torture against political opponents of government in power, Ordinary citizens accused of supporting rebel groups as well as suspected common criminals. Victims are usually severely beaten with rifle bats, sticks, electrical cables, and other objects. According to Uganda Human Rights Commission, in their 25th annual report, violation of freedom from torture topped human rights abuses across the country at 36% of all complaints received. I would like to draw our attention, right on the speaker, to the holy incident that happened at Sheikh Kamoga's residence, which we all saw in early June 2023. Police officers were captured on video, indiscriminately beating up and torturing teenagers who were suspected to be attending radicalization classes. They were suspects, beaten, dehumanized, and tortured. Somehow life goes on in Uganda. Comrades, Women and members of parliament we are in, in, in imaginably manhandled just outside this building, which they peacefully, where well, they peacefully march towards the Ministry of Internal Affairs, uh, following brutal foiling of women's day celebrations. Right on the speaker and colleagues, we want to thank you for the way you've handled that. And I hope it was a lesson to all and sundry in dealing with the basic rights of citizens and especially leaders. Right on the speaker three, the right to due process. And I'll record Psalms 82, verses 3 to 4. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the poor and afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hands of the wicked. I will comment on the judiciary's role in advancing social justice in that area or other causes for public good. Courts of law, being the last bastion of human rights, have a task to make best human rights meaningful. 
to the deprived and vulnerable sections of the community. I will quote the words of Professor Joey Oloko Nyango in his book titled, When Courts Do Politics, Public Interest Law and Litigation in South Africa, where he stated that in matters regarding social justice, courts must decide whether to pursue a course known as judicial activism or hold themselves back in a posture of its opposite, otherwise known as judicial restraint. In most cases, of the speaker, our courts of law have opted for restraint by either denying the citizens the right to a fair trial or the right to an effective remedy. We have witnessed situations where citizens are unjustifiably denied bail, prolonged pretrial detentions, and case backlogs. In worst case scenarios, some cases are dismissed on technicalities. Wholesomely, right on the speaker, the conduct of the judiciary has essentially rendered justice of little use. In my view, a citizen whose constitutional rights are, are regularly trampled upon must not be turned away from the court by procedural hiccups. Once a complaint is arguable, a way must be found to accommodate him or her so that other citizens become knowledgeable of their rights. We need a bold and courageous judiciary to take the challenges of public interest litigation and through judicial activism, give vitality to the constitution and meaning to human rights. Last year, Eternal Speaker, I brought to the attention of the House the internal bickerings and controversies in the judiciary, which have disfigured the expectations of the quality of justice. The situation has not changed for the better, to date, there are still apparent mistreatments of some judicial officers and staff. These controversies have not only violated victims' rights, but also preoccupied the judiciary and deflected the judiciary from attaining to its core mandate. My clarion call to the judiciary is to rise to the occasion and uphold the right to due process in its full sense. Four, freedom to expression and media freedom. Let me speak. I want to quote the former and late UN Secretary General Kofi Annan in 1999, who recognized the role of free media involvement by stating that press freedom is a cornerstone of human rights. It holds governments responsible for their acts and serves as a warning to all that impunity is an illusion. It advances knowledge and understanding within and between countries. It helps peoples everywhere appreciate what unites us and not what divides us. Let me speaker, close of quote. It is our observation that in Uganda, there are various legal and extra legal mechanisms that restrict media freedom against national, regional, and international protocols on freedom of expression. Uganda's legal and policy framework springs from Article 29A of the Constitution, which says that every person shall have the right to freedom of, of freedom of speech and expression, which shall include freedom of press and other media. The textual framework of the state constitutional provision was drawn from the international legal instruments to which Uganda is a signatory, via the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention Against Torture and Other Forms of Cruel, Inhuman and Degrading Treatment, as well as the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. The practical application of the right of expression and media freedom has been subjected to restrictions and limitations. Let me speak, uh, trying to summarize, they say, that said, will, as the opposition in this session, continue defending and promoting freedom of expression and media freedom through advocacy on different fora, legal reforms we intend to propose, and the capacity building of stakeholders to uphold media freedom as the tenet of our civilization. Five, the rights relating to labor. Article 23 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights sets out the right to work, the right to equal pay for equal work, and the just and the favorable enumeration and, and, uh, and Article 24 provides that everyone has the right to rest and leisure 
reasonable limitations of working hours, as well as periodic holidays with pay. Article 6, A and 7A of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Develop these rights further with regard to the right to work and its essential corollary, just favorable conditions of work. I will be specific on most pressing issues that I will speak to our citizens. The issue of minimum wage has remained on the fence for a long time. The government, particularly the president, has quite vocally expressed hesitancy and even aversion towards the call for a minimum wage. Honorable colleagues, it is imperative for us to take the lead in awakening the debate on the minimum wage for the minimum wage to address the plight of workers in this country. Let us not go down in history as a parliament that remained oblivious and aloof to this critical challenge facing the country's labor force. Secondly, it is imprudent for us to pass laws just for the record purposes. Our citizens are not working in safe and healthy conditions as envisaged under the Occupational Safety and Health Act 2006. The government has abdicated its role of inspecting workplaces on matters concerning occupational safety and health, welfare, and working environment. The citizens are working under horrible conditions and beyond reasonable working hours, which has significantly undermined their right to a quality life. Right on the speaker, it's not Uhuru, even for those who work beyond our borders, that like we have witnessed in the various statements of uh, people working abroad. Six, the right to a clean and healthy environment. Dr. Lord Speaker, the United Nations recognizes access to safe, clean health and sustainable environment as a fundamental human right. Unfortunately, in Uganda, poor sanitation and hygiene, as well as an equal access to safe drinking water, have put millions of people at the risk of exposure to waterborne diseases and even death. Of exploitation of our natural resources is increasingly leading to environmental degradation and contributing to reduced ecosystem services and disasters. The 2020 World Bank Climate Risk Profile for Uganda indicates that an average of 200,000 Ugandans is affected each year by environment related disasters. The country has continued to experience destructive floods, whose effects have been visible in low lying areas, especially in degraded wetland areas. We all saw what happened in Katonga, Katonga Speaker, and other places. Katonga Speaker, the government has formulated a number of policies to regulate land use and the impact of human activities on the environment. However, the alarming rate at which natural resources are being depleted shows that these laws and the policies are not enforced effectively. It is regrettable that the government continues to selectively apply the said laws against the poor people and those without connections while sparing and protecting the rich who encroach on them on facts of wetlands and forest across the country with impunity we have had debates of rice growers the poor communities and the rich freely growing rice while the poor must leave the wetlands so the laws being applied inequitably right on the speaker eventually affecting the environment the right to health, right now speakers, number seven. Health is both a human right in itself and an essential means to for the realization of other human rights. Unfortunately, in Uganda, the rot in health in our healthcare system deteriorates every day. It is characterized by very low wages of health workers, shortage of health workers, inadequate supplies of medicines, sundries, and essential equipment in government facilities insufficient hospital beds, and poor accessibility to health facilities. Not only speaker, I could have spoken more about this. I have a, a big report on my oversight visits on government health facilities. And we have had the warning by health workers of an impending strike. They have given a warning in 15 days. I actually thought that a serious government would have made a report to parliament about this warning. But of course, the government is dozing on duty. The, the poor will suffer when this strike announced 15 days ahead happens. I don't know, Speaker, the right to education. Article 30 guarantees all persons the right to education. 
and Article 34.2 enshrines the child's right to basic education. The national objective and eight principles of state policy, especially uh, policy 26, 28, obligate the state to provide free and compulsory basic education and to take measures to ensure that every citizen can attain the highest standard of education possible. However, this device, this mandate, the country continues to be plagued with, plagued with myriad of challenges. The education sector grapples with high levels of teacher and pupil student absenteeism, weak school level management structures, inadequate learning materials, understaffing, overcrowded classrooms, and lack of accommodation for teachers. Right on, Lord Speaker, I have made an inquest with my team on the sector, on this sector, and we are going to provide an independent report on education. I do not know whether my constituency is unlucky and the honorable members come from privileged constituencies. If we do not wake up about education, I want to assure this House Honorable Speaker, we are in their straits. In this century, you find people sitting on rugs and huge stones in the classes. Schools without toilets. <laughs> Teachers without toilets. Schools in mud and water and their government schools. Schools, government schools without teachers. I was in Ibovuma, a government primary school has one teacher. Don't know speaker. Seven. The right to property. You can now see why I listened to the president, but I never heard him. The right to property. I, I am aware that you listened on, on radio. On, yes, on, I listened, but I never heard. Right on speaker. That's what I said. Because you, you are not in Kololo. Right on speaker. I listened. I never heard. Seven. May, may, maybe, the right to maybe the maybe the lobs ears had problems. Because if you cannot hear, then the lobs problem. Order. Yes, yes, Stephen. Stephen, you cannot listen and you don't hear. Uh, you, you can hear it may be negative, but you don't but you at least you hear. Yes, Stephen. Uh, right honorable speaker, respectively. Uh, the leader of opposition. I wonder whether it would be in order to say uh, you did not hear. And yet you are here responding. What are you responding? What would you respond for what you didn't hear? Is it in order to even respond on what you did not hear? No, that's why I'm, uh, I am uh, asking my clerk maybe to send my lead of opposition for some medical and ENT checkup. <laughs> because at least I'm aware he responded and he has written a very good report. That is after understanding what was being said. Yes, Lord. To the speaker, I went to Chamagana Boys Primary School in Masaka. My language teacher was Miss Alboa Seboa. I blame him for my nature of expression. I don't know, speaker. And uh, I apologize to the honorable colleague for, on behalf of my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yes, can we, can we move on? Love. I don't know, speaker. And all our colleagues, I'm talking about the right to property. You know, I said at the beginning that I am basing my response on uh, human rights, education, health, property, and I'm trying to make a difference the way we, we present these, not as a crumb work, but as a real, a real response to the issues that obtain. <laughs> Dr. Honorable Speaker, Article 26 of the Constitution of Uganda guarantees the right to, of every person to own property, either individually or in association with others. And unfortunately, for the past two decades, land grabbing, land grabbing disputes apparent in mass and violent evictions 
ceaseless and long court cases have occasioned land conflict related murders leading, leading to devastating consequences for our country Dr. Honorable Speaker, without uh, reading verbatim my entire text on this subject, one of the issues we have demanded here severally is for government to table the Justice Magamere report on land inquiry, the, the Land Inquiry Commission that clearly exposed very, very worrying relationship between government officials, security personnel, politicians, and the general public. The failure to table this report be made public, right on the speaker, for some of us is very telling. And the evictions, the land grabbing goes on unencumbered, and there is a government. Right on the speaker. Right on the speaker, if you give each member 10 minutes, to speak about land grabbing and who's doing it in their constituencies, the country will understand the gravity of the problem. Somehow, we the powerful have descended on the poor and we are grabbing their everything, everything at their disposal. I was in Rue, right on our speaker. I visited a sub county and a military officer had terrorized the village and the entire community was fleeing for their life. For the record, the village is called Manyama in Iruelo, I hope. When I reported that, there was a follow-up. The women reported that this military officer had brought rascals that were raping them and their children. Yes, they were on record on TV. They even mentioned names. And he only wanted one thing. They must leave the village for him and his cattle. He had let his cattle feed on their, on their, on their uh, gardens, their crops, and was a proa in the entire community. That community is represented by the Honorable Sech Choleko, right Honorable Speaker. So they gave you the name of the military officer? Yes. Yes. And, and you presented it because, you know, if you don't bring out the person, they will think it is General Kavuma. You, you see, and yet General Kavuma is a very good person. Uh, yes, that, you will that, think uh, General Luelu. So we need, right, it needs to be on record. Right. It was so and so. Right, not, speaker. Not the whole army. I am presenting a full statement to Parliament on land grabbing and who is doing it on notice. You'll hear to know what is in Mokono, a military officer again, bought land, sold to citizens, and then evicted them after selling to them. It's really despicable. So I am going to make a full presentation, Madam right Speaker. Please online. do, at least it's not for now, it is not our general who are here. No, 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 no. If if it were one of them, I would have mentioned them. I know each one of them. Madam right <laughs> Speaker, <laughs> issue number. Uh, Number nine, protection of the vulnerable groups. Right to speaker, there's a need to urgently strengthen the capacity of the most vulnerable people to access justice and claim their rights, as well as ensuring that the state is, obligate, is obliged to perform its attendant duties and obligations in human rights protection, gender equality, rule of law, and a just society for everyone. The government is mandated under, under Chapter 4, Articles 31 to 40, and Chapter 16, Article 246 of the Constitution, protect and promote the rights of vulnerable population, to address gender inequalities, to ensure cultural growth, labor and employment, as well as community mobilization and empowerment. It is imperative for the state to strengthen human capital development, community mobilization, and improve governance through promoting the rights of vulnerable persons. The acknowledgement of this role has, however, not been supported by adequate government priorities in resource allocation over the years. The gender sector remains among the least funded. Without proper resources for this sector, the country runs the risk of achieving superficial development 
that increases existing inequalities and excludes the most vulnerable and marginalized citizens. It is essential that no citizen is left behind as the country realizes this, this vision. This should be done through ensuring a significant proportion of labor force transitioning into gainful employment and enterprise involvement. Let us speaker, the, the government has issued a budget called circular and has banned any entity from recruiting. But in the meantime, the president said that the economy will grow between 4 and 6 percent, but it cannot create any single job. What a contradiction. A growing economy cannot create a single job. So are we speaking uh, the truth or it's simply bluffing the population? I don't know, Speaker. I don't know, Speaker. Um, uh, briefly, um, I've titled the rights of refugees. Uh, the members will read that. I'll go to also skip the right to adequate standard of living and ask members to go through it. The right, the slum growth and the homelessness, right on the speaker. I'll go to B, which is page 20, the capacity of local government to respond to disasters is one of the major challenges. Right on the speaker, numerous disaster occurrences have been recorded across the country over the past years. The response only speaks volumes on Uganda's capacity to contain disasters on even basic magnitudes without huge losses and, or and fatalities. Massive damage to both public and private property has been witnessed with such obvious response such as relief taking ages to get to the victims. Shamelessly, government ministers have brought statements indicating that the situation was under control when it wasn't. Instead, it has been UNICEF, Uganda Red Cross, making critical interventions. The government is either late or feeding the population on propaganda. While the National Policy for Disaster Preparedness and Management presents holistic institutional structure for disaster preparedness, there is inadequate, there is this, there is practice gaps in the coordination that hinder successful disaster preparedness and response. The disconnect is visible between OPM and the local governments. Right on the speaker, I did ask this house last week that we operationalize the provisions of Article 256 to, uh, to operationalize the, um, um, the emergency fund, which does not expire, and expects the government in the next financial year to make provision for it, so that we do not run to the Prime Minister all the time for small things, blankets, cassava, firewood, cups. That should be with local governments. Somebody, just imagine my sister from Katakui looking for the Prime Minister to give mugs to mothers to feed their children, and they have to look for a Prime Minister. Local governments must be empowered to handle those small, small things, and really make a government functional. So people want basins, you look for the Prime Minister. No, 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 no. Capolin is a Prime Minister. No, that's not the way governments are run. On page 21, I will speak about uh, the collapse of decentralization as we know it. Right on the speaker, the impetus for fostering decentralization service delivery ensures from the perceived inefficiencies associated with centralization. Right on the speaker, our concern that the government has swept this provision under the carpet in favor of decentralization. The current decentralization of revenue collection has derailed the service delivery in local governments such as garbage collection, waste disposal and management, road maintenance, among others. This stance has stripped local governments of authority over their resources leading to poor service delivery. Let on the speaker, we have spoken about this. I am waiting for a government minister of the Prime Minister to come and explain to Parliament why is the NRM government decentralizing in violation of the constitution. Why are they recalling local government powers? So that the Minister of Local Government attempt to go to Nyendo to collect garbage on behalf of government. So the taxpayers in Nyendo remit their taxes to Kampala 
and the Honorable Moses holds on to their money, are waiting for the state to decay, and then sends some small trinkets to them. So what are we up to? I know most of the members here and the yellow governments are suffering silently. On this side, we are, not, we are going to suffer crying out and making noise until the constitutional obligation of running government under decentralization is restored. Why is the NLM government decentralizing? Is the president who usurp the constitutional powers of local governance and is now the local government? Mr. Speaker, lastly, I want to submit about the general impediments to enjoyment of rights. One is the general performance of the economy, as we know it. Mm -hmm. The economy is projected to grow at 6.5% uh, in 2023 and 67 in 2024. Mr. Speaker, on the face, that should send us for a party at the biggest hotel in Kampala. Given the global growth slowdown and the fragile border trade in East Africa, Uganda obviously is likely to suffer the consequences. Mr. Speaker and the colleagues, this project is incredulous because more than 41% of the 44.3 million Ugandans continue to grapple with abject poverty. And the latest poverty figures are pointing in an upward direction, which is scary, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, if I may be brief on this, one of the reasons why poverty is growing is because the government failed to implement the post-COVID economic interventions. They failed to implement them. They, was, they supplied the country with a lip service. Businesses did not recover. People closed the businesses. Others lost jobs. The recovery is non-existent. It's a paper tiger, right on the speaker. Two is corruption. It is appalling that Uganda ranks 26th in terms of global corruption. This level of corruption has a significant impact on economic, social, and cultural rights, including access to basic necessities like education, health care, and employment. It's clear that income inequality, poverty, and direct consequences of this corruption, which in turn hinders economic growth and restricts access to economic rights. Furthermore, the mismanagement of public resources only serves to further undermine the effectiveness of government. Right on the speaker, on corruption, our concern is on how government, and especially the presidency, has elected to put in place parallel institutions to fight corruption. The main institutions, the IGG, the prosecution in the DPP office are underfunded, but we are creating prior structures and funding them. So is the presence frustrated? If frustrated, do you answer by creating prior structures to rival, in our view, General Speaker, those new structures are hiding places for corruption? And that's why we are concerned yeah. the, president, the president in particular decreed that army officers should not declare their wealth. Once For us, this side is part of the total grass in which the corrupt are hiding. The hey. Three, the initiative of distribution of public resources. And Uganda is important for resource allocation and economic activity. However, it often neglects important sectors such as health and education. But on the speaker, our invitation in this area is to figure out critical sectors that really balance the needs of the population to avoid situations where there is skewed development and allocation of resources. I have given the figures of these security developments and allocations. So, the updated burden, the figures are they are sickening, they are worrying, and before we know it, the weight of the debt will collapse on our backs. I hope no one will be, will be found abroad when the debt crisis sinks on us, and all of us shall carry it. Yes.
as parliament and as leaders and bear it on behalf of the people for on whose behalf we have acquired it file the pdm the pdm right on the speaker was launched in, uh, to lift households from subsistence to monetary economy however there are concerns regarding the selection of beneficiaries the unstable market and fluctuating prices for cultural goods disjointed financing interventions inadequate infrastructure capacity and mismanagement of group funds the allocation of resources did not take into account the unique needs of each district or each parish additionally the pdm committees have been either dormant or non-existent there also has been cases of misappropriation of these funds as well as bias selection criterion and gra gross underfunding with limited enterprise selection. That will not speak up. The emphasis of the PDM has serious selection challenges that we have discussed here for a one size fits all approach, which for me is really a stony age approach to poverty alleviation. Most of your constituencies are farmer constituencies. As we speak right on the speaker, government did not make a provision for suppliers of seeds, uh, coffee seedlings, and tea seedlings. But besides, they are demanding 46 billion from government and there's no allocation. What's happening? These honorable members will tell you that they are losing their properties to money lenders. They borrowed it to set up nursery beds. There's no provision. They are losing properties. Probably in a, a response, I accept the Vice President will respond whether these are sacrificial lambs for the PDM. That the, the project has sacrifices to make in terms of people's businesses and homes. Road infrastructure, Reno Speaker. This afternoon, we have discussed the inadequate provision and we concur. Probably somebody looked at my uh, statement here. The road infrastructure is sick, as we know it. I have a problem, right on the speaker, with the way the resources for road infrastructure are distributed. In our conversation, right on the speaker, we need to make provision. For example, it is very okay, for example, to have oil roads because it's a key sector. Where are coffee roads? Where are gold roads? Where are the banana roads? I was in a Cassandra three weeks ago. Cassandra gives the country a billion worth of gold every day. Does not have a single Tamaka road. It's like a graveyard. I don't know speaker. I hope somebody takes notice. Remember, I don't know speaker. Up to now, the gold miners the exporters, the gold merchants do not pay any tax to government. You go to Cassandra, it's very, very scary. Okay, I told them that if you have gold, this is how you look. Please keep your gold. I'll keep my coffee in Masaka. I don't need gold in Masaka. If you have gold, it means looking like that. I would rather keep the, uh, the coffee and no gold at all. That one speaker, I have broadly written about defense and internal affairs. Our concern mainly relates to our defense missions abroad. There are very serious challenges. There are complaints. I received a petition yesterday, right on the speaker, from uh, part of our mission on, uh, uh, on of police in Somalia deployed in 2020 to work for one year and one month they returned one and a half years ago they were only paid three months their money was i have a list of these men and women who were deployed in somalia for one year and one month returned a year ago three months paid their money was released by au somebody has it on his account or her account let me speak up so the concerns over these deployments 
is a very serious concern. When you see, first listen. When you see you men make, and women return in in a distress. Noise, if you want to make a noise, National Theatre is just next to here. <laughs> By your name of theater. When you see officers and men in distress, that, these are some of the challenges. And I will formally relay their petition and an investigation should ensue on what happened to their money. The last component right on the speaker from me are mafia run sectors on page 27. One of them is mining. The larger unregulated mining industry is costing Uganda heavily in terms of lost revenue, environmental damage, and exploitation of vulnerable communities. There is massive criminality around investments in Uganda's vast reserves of sand, a very vulnerable commodity by cartels, with, with support from influential people within government and the other connections. The cost of sand mining to the environment is steep, and has destabilized the sensitive ecology around Lake Victoria and other water catchment areas. The mining is also labor intensive, employment, employing, men of, uh, employing men and many youth, many of whom are underage children. Illegal gold mining has occasioned illicit financial flows on Uganda's mining ecosystem. It is estimated that the economy loses about two trillion every single year in illegal gold exports. Gold exports from illegal artisanal mines in Uganda amount to 2.8 tons a year, with the children constituting 30% of the miners. Right on the speaker, this can be verified in the mines of Kassanda. I was there. It is very scary, right on the speaker. The Auditor General noted in his report on the performance of URA for the financial 2021-22, that URA failed to collect 340 billion in taxes from gold exports in one financial year, which was estimated to be recovered after the 5% levy was implemented. But on the speaker, these are gold exporters, but the poor people in the market stalls are paying taxes. The machinery and uh, mafia groups in mine not pay any taxes, right on the speaker. Secondly, fisheries. Much as the Ugandan fisheries sector is vital for the economy, the army under the guise of curbing illegal fishing practices has caused the depletion of resources and uh, just fire restricted the fishing activities. The UPDF have out of impunity continue to terrorize and blatantly torture fishermen on various water bodies of Uganda. Fish is being impounded from fishermen by the military, who in turn make, it a, make a killing out of it. Harassment and death at the hands of the armored personnel have been reported on the lakes. Fishermen are terrorized and their nets seized. They are accused of using particular nets, now deemed illegal, yet they are manufactured in Uganda and cleared for import. Ironically, the government knows about the trade in such a year because taxes are paid on them. Parliament has passed numerous resolutions suspending UPDF activities on the water bodies as far as regulation of fisheries is concerned and all in vain. Today, right on the speaker, the fisheries, fisheries and Aquatic Act has not been operationalized and implemented. While the fisheries and uh, Culture Act 2022 deems UPDF presence on the lakes unlawful, they still disrupt fishing activities and profit from confiscated fish and gear. Your Honourable Speaker, in my report on the fishing sector, out of my excursion, there is a unit that operates fishing activities on the lakes with the boats labeled Watch Our Seme. Watch Our Seme. Yeah, Watch Our Seme. So it is uh, a fishing entity of the APDF where they tell people that it is illegal fish there, they are wantonly fishing, and they do not care. 
and the locals know who own these boats and which officers are fishing. Where they export and where they pay taxes, heavens no. That's how I call it a mafia-run sector, causing and visiting and visit uncalled for harm to the population. And somehow life goes on in Uganda. Right on the speaker, on a notice to the house, uh, my shadow minister for fisheries has a ready motion with your permission, right on the speaker, it should be of the order paper this week or next week, depending on your kind indulgence, for an inquest into these vi violations in the fishing communities. I know across the aisle, members are representing suffering communities without a voice. And the house must come clean on where we stand on these violations, right on the speaker. In conclusion, right on the speaker, I believe this account will create an ease and discomfort for the perpetrators of the sponsored violations. And I'm not here actually to cause comfort. Pray that they find humility to change for the better. Of course, I am not oblivious of the fact that they do not feel any sense of responsibility and recourse for their atrocities. Although we have uh, embraced a human rights-based approach to the state of the nation and the budget, previously we are not motivated by unreasoned expectations that things will change overnight. We are aware that there are powerful structural, political, economic, and embodied constraints against alternative approaches. Thus, our efforts are to rally the change seekers across the aisle to the common cause and offer direction for our relentless efforts. That said, right on the speaker, there is strong and overwhelming evidence that supports changes of human rights violations against the state apparatus and their charges of human rights violations against the state apparatus and their accomplices, including reports from various human rights organizations and the personal accounts from victims of state-sponsored violence and torture. Despite this evidence, individual perpetrators of these heinous crimes are not being brought to justice due to the pervasive impunity in the country. I detest a situation where both the legislative and the judicial arms of government would be completely emasculated by the sitting government to the extent of rendering no redress to these violations. I do not want to sound alarmist, but we must intervene and act now in order to prevent a catastrophic outcome for our nation. Thus, in order to investigate the illegal and gross human rights violations meted out against the people of Uganda over the years, a commission of inquiry should be established in due course for various violations to bring justice and offer hope to the victims, Dr. Honor Speaker. Dr. Honor Speaker, I have attached an indication of legislative interventions we intend to make uh, across there. And Dr. Honor Speaker, inform the House that uh, while the House gave um, leave to a number of your members to bring particular legislation to bear, we are facing uh, resistance from finance. And tomorrow I'll visit your office with members that finance is giving hell to bring their bills to the House for your intervention as per the rules of the Speaker. I thank you, uh, all the members, for your patience and listening. For good and my country. Thank for you. For good and my country. Thank you so much. Lead of opposition and is responding under Rule 53. I want to thank you for your exhaustive report. I have listened to a 30 page report addressing the issues that were raised by the president. And I want to observe that 21 out of the 30, the, the leader of opposition is talking about the human rights. The human rights of the persons in Uganda, human rights development in Uganda, and cognizant of the fact that uh, the president also covered other issues. Of course, human rights has been an issue in this house. 
it has been an issue. It has been raised a number of times, and uh, government has tried to respond. Uh, apart from the human rights, the president talked about the agricultural productivity. He also talked about industrialization and then social services. On the issue of human rights, the missing persons, this house has over time, from time to time, discussed issues of missing persons. You, if you look at the Hansard, it is there. On the issue of several cases of arrests in cities, these have been subject to a process in various courts of law. And a leader of opposition has been very kind enough to be one of the people representing those persons in court. So at least they have been given that uh, freedom. Much as they are arrested, of course, for the sake of those arrested, their right to legal representation has also been respected. It has been respected by, by executive, including some members of parliament. It, it must be on record. Yes, things may not be well, but not something is being done. <laughs> The right of freedom of expression, this is existing in this country, except those who think they are really, they, they have the right, the impunity to abuse people on social media. And I like the president, for one thing, signing the Computer Misuse Act. Because people think it is about them and that kind of thing. Let it be there. Because today they're abusing me, tomorrow they abuse Lope, tomorrow another day, Vice President. These people also should be. On the issue of education, uh, leader of opposition, it remains universal in both primary and secondary. Me, I'm talking to the leader of opposition because the leader of opposition is like we are in a country without anything. It remains universal, both in primary and secondary. Yes, we have challenges. We grew up in a school where we would sit in a, 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 a stone, a log, that kind of thing. We have a lot of challenges. And of course, all this is budgetary in, in nature. We need to work together as a house to make sure that uh, we improve these issues. Money has been put in education but uh, something is being done, and then the issue of the right to property. We are expecting your paper on the issue of grabbing of land. The persons who grab land will be brought to book. They must be brought to book. We will not have a blank statement that is grabbing of land, no. We want to name and shame the persons so that we have a clean government and say, it is so and so who will grab the land, not just a blank statement and this, this if you remember this house this house has debated on issues of property the custodian board we had a paper in this house the indians were given back their land it was from government and it was legislated in this house so it is not totally that nothing is being done something is being done that's why we have the laws in place the issue of refugees. When you look at the refugees, we still remain one of the biggest hosts of refugees. And that is, uh, we are next to Turkey and Iran and Colombia. We still host the refugees in this country, despite the numerous really challenges that we have. We've tried that as a country, and that should also be given some kind of appreciation, the right to adequate standard of living. The adequate standard of living, that is the function of productivity, the opportunity and enabling environment. And this an enabling environment, you don't be speaking. <laughs> you don't be speaking. But <laughs> we have challenges, but 
we have an enabling environment where we can quarrel, abuse everybody, disagree. We have the environment is there. The issue of PDM, the issue of PDM in that is a national development strategy that is trying to reduce poverty. The issue is, will it reduce? It has challenges, which we, we all need to come in and ensure that we handle issue of the challenges so that we reduce poverty among us, our people. It is about our leaders. We, the leaders, should come out and ensure that PDM works out well. But if we sit back and say we are waiting for government, we will wait until cows return home. But if we say, let's put all our energy and ensure that PDM works out, we put a lot of money in PDM, let's not go into lamentation. And then the other issue is infrastructure development. The problem we have with infrastructure development, when you look at our appropriation as parliament, infrastructure takes a lot of money, the biggest amount of money. But the issue, and what we talked about, the issue of having no regulations, lack of discipline, people don't know what they are doing, yet a lot of money is being put in the sector. So, leader of opposition, we put a lot of money there, we now need to work together. And as the Minister of Work said, they will come with regulations in one month. I think one month is even too much. We need the regulations to operationalize most of the laws that have been presented to this house. You cannot pass a law and you cannot operationalize it. So we need to have the, the regulations for us to be able to operationalize these laws. Defense and security, of course, despite the, terror, the threats of terrorism, Uganda still remains the most peaceful country as of now. It still remains most peaceful. And um, uh, the operation, I want to thank government for one thing. Two days back, NUP had a very successful procession in, in uh, Jinja, uninterrupted. Leave these people to have their uh, uninterrupted. So the issue of oppression, and I also want to congratulate UPC for winning OYAM. That shows democracy. And uh, the lady is going to be voted. The lady is going to be sworn in on Thursday. Okay? Honorable members. <laughs> Honorable members. Honorable uh, members. <coughs> Lop has given a report. Where we see we have weaknesses, we will correct it. We will go get a, a comprehensive report to that effect. But where we see that there, it's not what is being said per se, it's a blank statement, then government should also be appreciated why it has doing, done something. Can I now get from this side? I will only take five people. I want to take, I start with the OO. I will start with the OO. I am starting with the OO. Thank you. The leader of opposition has spoken it all. If you decide, sit. Sit. <laughs> That is, that is how much I respect my leader of opposition. Oh, oh. Thank you, right honorable speaker, and I must thank uh, honorable, honorable members. Can you sit? Just good manners that you... <laughs> the freedom of expression in this house, everybody talks the way they want, but uh, when the leader of opposition or the vice president speaks, then we close. Okay. I want to thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity, and I want to also thank the leader of opposition for opposing the presidential address to the nation. And uh, you see, Right Honorable. And, and I wish you 
Anda hoje chorou. Thank you, Rex, honorable speaker. Under rule, the rule that the law presented. <laughs> Rule 44, right, Honorable Speaker. The leader of opposition has a right of response, but not to oppose. Is the Honorable Member in order to stand and say that the leader of opposition simply gave a statement to oppose while he was exercising his role as a leader of opposition to give a statement? Is he in order? Rule 44 is on conditions of adm admissibility of questions. So you have raised it on a wrong rule. Next. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for a wise ruling. That goes back to taking orientation very seriously. Right Honorable Speaker, and I was the response of law was largely, as you've observed already, on matters of human rights, and they adopted that deliberately. And uh, the matters that he raised that uh, has been here for a while he is my friend until probably today when he will disown me. But uh, matters of human rights in this country, NRM government, where I belong together with LOP, We all belong to one government. The government is being led by NRM and the leader of opposition is a, is a citizen of this country. Let's, 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 it's not a matter of debate. <laughs> really? Right Honorable Speaker. Listen. Right Honorable Speaker. Now, Honorable Members. Honorable members. Thank you very much. It is either that we agree that human rights are universal, it is a two way traffic, it has obligations, rights, and obligations. This government that I know. Part of what the uh, LOP said, these are matters that uh, I've not heard from you in a short while, in a, but uh, I can give you guarantee that the government cannot abduct any citizen of Uganda. The abduction that we are referring to here, these are matters that we handled with the Law, Prime Minister, and research. And uh, now you, this is the tolerance. This is the tolerance that we need to accord each other. Honorable members, honorable members, when a leader of opposition was speaking, however hard it was, people listened. Let's be tolerant to each other. Huh? No, let him finish. Patrick, for now, uh -uh. let him finish first. Then you'll, you'll give your deliberation. Thank you, you right honorable speaker, for, for the opportunity to proceed. I may not say what you don't, you, you, you don't want to hear, but uh, it's also my right. Just as like your right when you get up to speak in this house to say what you think you are convicted to say and you have passion for it. I will begin with the scripture that uh, Honorable Lop quoted. Psalm 82, verse 3 to 4. Maybe let me also quote Ephesians 4, verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. That says the Lord.
for us, it is easy to point the wrong. And the way I see Honorable Lop, and he knows for many years, when you have a mirror that reflects you, you cannot destroy that mirror. That's how I see if there is an opposition. That's how I see it. But the mirror must tell me whether my barber did a good job or not, not to put other things which are not there. If a mirror is bringing other images which are not correct, then I have a problem. But a world without opposition is a dead one. We are here every day struggling to be better than what we were yesterday because we have opposing forces. Now, right honorable speaker, you indicated that these are matters that we have talked about here. Probably you will make further rulings. To get to hear the narrative of people that the government of Uganda abducted the people, citizens, this is very, 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 very unfortunate. At least those names, we have them. We have given where we have accounted for those that are in prison. It is only in Uganda that where people are arrested and they are taken as abducted. It is only in Uganda. It is honorable on, members, it is the, on, honorable members, the issues of human rights were brought to this house. The co it was referred to the Committee of Human Rights. It was debated and it was closed. Can you go to the next item? Perfectly so. I want to summarize that we should look at the criminality versus political act activism. We should defend the rights of every Ugandan, including those we don't agree with, and that is the government I know, where I belong. Right Honorable Speaker and the colleagues, the right to governance, the law talked about, election, there are probably about four types of democracies, direct, indirect, which we call also representative, constitutional, and the fourth one is uh, what? My dictatorship. So, to say that in this country, when we have few isolated cases of malpractices by people who are either selfish or misled, and we get the head of state condemning such acts in this country, we would applaud such a president. Honorable members, if we do not have that kind of transparency, then we don't have Dr. Pio being sworn on Thursday. We are swearing in Dr. Pio. We have a number of members of parliament we have a members of numbers of parliament who are opposition in this house, and they went through the same system. So, they were, they, okay, you survived, and you're in a government. Go to the Thank next item. On the, the issue of uh, military officers being mentioned, I believe at the time that will come, but we want to set the record correct. It's not a government policy, neither is it a Minister of Defense or UPDF policy for any military officer to grab land. But also, it, those military officers have rights to own, and they can own anywhere. It would be wrong to paint a UPDF officer who is somewhere struggling over his rights over land. Which he owned legally. Which he, or he got legally, or there is dispute.
to ground but, but where he is getting illegally then there is where he gets illegally he should be condemned strictly so and we don't condemn we, we don't condone those illegal or unlawful practices i want that to be on record we have gallant men and women in uniform some of whom are here they are supposed it's not a crime for them to be in that uniform it takes sacrifice to be in that uniform but having a blanket a blanket blame on the military we would be shooting ourselves down I've, i would be glad to receive the name of those special officers who are illegally grabbing lad from people so that we work on them according to the law thank you very much honorable members how i wish you would be patient with each other Aha, lop, Mathias, Mpuga, Nsamba. Nsonga watu wazi nyonyode, ezili mugwanga Uganda, jaise, javada itabade, adamu okuogira kwa muami museven kwa yugira keri yugwanga. Naga manti ya yugira nuwa lue nsonga zata kwa atako. Ngo kuchovole dembeli ovuntu, banda Uganda bawa ambibu wabuzibu wabata manjikidu wako maitile. Ama nyanaga wayo era munonga muasimbye sira kuchibalama John Bosco e yabuzi wao mwagwa kumi gwa kumi bili kumi na mwenda pako wayo tadanga mukula bibu wako na wabuzo mwagwa kumi bili ya abidi pako wayo tupala bibu wangako angayevu za abantu wa nubali rudawa abantu wa nubali dawa abantu wa nani abalina washite bali itibwa agambi enti binobi kolo ate bisani demu gwanga Uganda e bana Uganda banansi atiba ine dembe okuwagira chebetaga lokubanga bawagira chaguranyi center mu Robert Bobby Wine tekitegeza ntate bakwatwe basiwe batulugunizibwe obwemage olwecho chebakiririza agamanti uh, walwo ne nsonga za banamaje abanamaje abali mu kugena nga babetta kali abantu atenga batulugunya nga babatta bayisa bobi lokubanti bali ne mmundu Parliament ya Mugambie aletolu kalalaro wa banda majabu wa bali mkube takali abantu na asu zanta agenda kujana alo aluweyo. Amuno aluminiza saba minister alubina na banja okubanga manchi wala majoni bosko wajali ne paka no walero tavanga yo kulaga wa family wa tata wa wajali wa umami wa wajali wa umana wa wajali agamba alubina na banja saba minister aveyo atuwe chivala majoni bosko where we have been responding on the same motion. I'm seeing ourselves going into a situation where we are debating the leader of opposition's statement. Yet, yet, right honorable speaker, we would be saying, anybody who stands up to say, yes, the leader of opposition, yes, the president missed this, yes, he never mentioned this, or he said it this way. The read of opposition has used a human rights approach to his issues, as simple as that. So, right honourable speaker, right honourable speaker, are we proceeding well? He's on procedure. Are we proceeding well, right honourable speaker? If people start giving a response to the leader of opposition, forgetting the main debate which we started weeks ago. Which we are still, uh, we, 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 they are losing it, right, Honorable Speaker? Uh, honorable members, if nobody is debating on the lead of opposition's uh, submission. Actually, I responded to all what the leader of opposition raised. The state of nation address was passed. Honorable members, this side equally has a right to give a rebuttal. But the fact that the side had a, a, a has a the fact that it has a, a, a right to give a rebuttal. I made a rebuttal. I did, I gave a rebuttal to all the issues that were raised. 
I now put a question that this House records a vote of thanks to His Excellency the President for a clear and concise exposition of government policy. Biyo, hivi gambo matha simpo gansa mbali ya wadema Parliament, ni hivi vudema mowirabi. Bagambi ba genda kongero kuna nyeleza, kwe biyo, hivi chamu biya yogedeko, ukubani cha masomero, amalua aliro, temuli dagala, ukubani hivi tayari yama districti, ba biya local government, tayari na buyenza, kula kumini mjiabio, abanu basonda, basolo zinsi biyo kubamba yabo msoro, choka tensi mimi soka nzidje kampala. Nibali wakabalu wazo bawa ayo busento butono. Echimali lizange mini mojiba ino kula tijikole dua. No sanga luku government zigu wabugwe. Agame chino chisana chikole weko, chisana chifi weko. Okula wangazino uwinza luku government. Uwinza ulume kuwambi wa maimu seven. Uwinza uwinza uwede mwezo districts. Siwenga zeko lila kubintu biazo. Ate mini mojiso ulo kutambula jilime kuzinga mabuzinga. Ayugede kuchiba taka na yugeda kuchisima musenyu. Walau awa wasi mumsenyo na inga wachikola ukutobo awa kwa nuno butonde wensi na the government tefayo nti ate government yenyi ni kwa toa butonde wensi nebo awa msinga nsi mbwa China nebo nuno butonde wensi aiwe dako kwa sima gorodi mowende na gamba ba nuteba wa abantu ba buli joto ba funam abamu sima wabu la abamu subla tewe ba funam na teba wa msolo government Nyo chone chuma jizanga government ya firwa. Ae na makubo. Aga gena wa sumwa golo. Diga fana nabu winyo nyo. Tegala gika mubano. Onzo gambo gena magombe wa walumbe tanda. Nore chonga asaba. Minobyo nabi tukuleze wabi kuleweko. Kuluwa Uganda ya fenunji. Tweba zanyo. Mathaya simpu uga nsamba. Uluwa reporte na ekole dua. Ewade nyuvu. Ewade ya mlembe. Kuluwa nilida bantu wa fea. Ababu ziwa wa. Ababu wa ambibu wa tuwa nyingidu wa kumaiti. Na ababu wa bafuneo buwenkanya. Na ababu wa makumera. Na ababu wa batewe. Kuluwa tuwa nina musango. Parlamenti wetu wetambu. Dewe wede. Nange ngamantitujia kudamtu wae. Muka masaba wa nkumire. Mwela wa.